Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world that knows that at Coors Field, anything is possible. I'm Jake Mintz. That's Jordan Schusterman. And when you have that much room for base hits, the activities are endless. You know, Jake, I never want to be too critical of your intros because you do them and I don't. And I greatly appreciate that you're the one that has that improvi- improvising responsibility. Um, but weird thing ha- weird things happening, of course. That's like day one baseball podcasting stuff. So uh, I, I, I just feel like, again, but you know what? That didn't mean this weekend was any different. And I'm glad that we acknowledge that that is indeed whatever the heck happened to the Braves this weekend will be discussed on this Monday edition of Baseball Barbercast. Lot to get to. I am in Toronto, Canada, where tonight I will see uh, some small Canadian artist named Avril Lavigne perform a greatest hits tour. Uh, I am so excited for that. I do not go to concerts, but this is obviously not a concert I was going to miss. I uh, also got to see J.J. Blade yesterday. How many people... That saw J.J. Blade yesterday and Avril Lavigne tonight. How do you think there will be some overlap this evening? Yes, there will no doubt be overlap. Although the number of people who could name J.J. Blade by name and saw J.J. Blade and are seeing Avril Lavigne is very small. Jordan, you have been to fewer concerts in your life than baseball games. The Seattle Mariners won over the weekend. You will tie <laughs> them tonight, going three to three. And let's hop right into it and begin as we always do. With the sweeps, bring out your brooms. We had, we'll say, three and a half sweeps over the weekend. Let's get the easy one out of the way. Cubs beat the White Sox twice. No freaking duh. If we could play the White Sox every day, we would also have 100 wins during the season. This did not carry the heft that we wanted it to after the White Sox beat the A's to nix the streak at 21. But still, it was great. Uh, And the Cubs, who are now one game under 500, have crawled their way back to three games within the final NL wildcard spot, a team that we had completely left for dead. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see Jordan's <laughs> absolutely no shocked idea. face. He had zero idea. They're Wait, two really? in the last 10. Oh, They've won four okay. in a row. And the Cubs are like, they're on the fringes. I mean, you could picture a world where they make the playoffs now, which is not true a week ago. They did They did buy at the deadline. So should we really be shocked? Um, I don't know about the Cubs, but good for them. I'm glad they beat the White Sox twice. That is better than losing to the White Sox twice. But hey, Grady Sizemore got his boys fighting. All right. They're coming out there and giving it their all, which they probably were doing before anyway. But now it's a lot cooler because it's Grady Sizemore managing. Cubs have a road trip. Starts next week at Miami, at Pittsburgh, at the Nats. There are wins to be oh. wins to be had. Jed, Jed is like Jed's keeping the receipts for the <laughs> for the haters. Uh, okay, so Cubs take those two. We had a couple two weird two game sets. We'll get to the other one later. But let's let's get to the sweep, Jay. Come on, this but was the a little reason. Early. The reason, way big reason, that the Cubs are looking pretty is that the NL wild card uh, picture is very complicated, and that is uh, the Mets. The Mets went to Seattle and got just beaten down the Mariners pitching staff starting rotation is very good if you are listening to this show you know that they allowed one run one earned run in 19 innings of work they made it you know they say if you do it you love it ain't work so we should say that the Mariners pitchers did 19 innings of joy allowing just one run and the Seattle baseball club takes all three games yeah so let me just say first that the Mets had a tough assignment here. The Mets were at the end of a very ridiculous road trip that was L.A. stop in St. Louis to play one game against the Cardinals that eliminated their off day, then go to Colorado, then (laughs) go to Seattle. (laughs) So they were kind of toast at the end of this, and and then go face Bryce Miller, Logan Gilbert, and Luis Castillo. Um, Sunday Night Baseball in Seattle for the first time in 20 years. And yeah, what you're referring to is just the starting pitching, right? I mean, Miller, there's I mean, there's not really a bad combination of Mariners starters at this point. And and that's really what I continue to marvel at as someone who watches this team, you know, almost every day is I wrote this whole big feature about the Mariners rotation coming into the year. And 
I, I don't really know what more you could ask for. I know technically only one of them made an all-star team, but the fact that they are getting, I think their quality start percentage is 62%, <laughs> which is by far the highest in the league. I think the Phillies are second around 50%, and then there's not that many other teams above like 40, 45. Logan Gilbert with his 19th of the season on Saturday, which tied Corbin Burns for the most in, most in baseball. And then, and then the dumper, man, uh, big dump, just dumping two home runs over the fence on Sunday night baseball in a game in which Luis Torrens was catching for the Mets, who was the catcher, one of the catchers the last time Cal Raleigh was not the main catcher for the Seattle Mariners was kind of a funny uh, reminder of, of just, you know, what Cal's become and, and how important he's been to this team. I have a big, big thing coming out on him. And then Gilbert uh, over over Yahoo uh, coming out this week. So you can keep an eye out for that. But, I mean, yeah, it was pure dominance. I obviously have been traveling. I, I didn't watch very much of it. But um, not just to see what the pitching did, but to see the offense actually really show up. The other big footnote from this series was that Julio came back from uh, an ankle injury seemingly a lot faster than people expected. And that may have showed on Sunday night when he went 0 for 5 with five strikeouts. He's really <laughs> the only person in the lineup that didn't really do anything on Sunday. But obviously fans are excited to see him back. But we'll see. It'll be really interesting to see, right? Because we haven't seen this team actually with all the players. You know, it's been it's looked better since they got Randy and, and Justin Turner. But we haven't actually seen the full version of this Mariners offense. And so it'll be really interesting to see how Julio looks. And hopefully it's not just 0 for 5, 5 strikeouts every time, because that's probably not going to be worth it if he's still injured. When when Julio moves back to center field, is he going to do Victor Robles' no-fly zone celebration when he makes a play, do you think? <laughs> I mean, people pointed this out, but Robles... <laughs> What a, what a run for Victor Robles and and people people were ready to de- declare the the Robles Linsanity run over and then he's like no 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 not so fast I'm gonna be mic'd up on Sunday Night Baseball having a grand old time I'm gonna keep reaching base I'm gonna keep making awesome catches he is a just a delight he's playing as as free as you could ever imagine <laughs> a player he is he is the definition of of change of scenery success story right now so well I, well I don't expect him to you know have a 900 OPS for the rest of his Mariners career I'm super interested what happens with him right he's he's technically a free agent um this 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 off season and. I don't I don't know how you really evaluate that market. He's already said, like, I love it here. I want to stay here. And so we'll see what that looks like for them. But obviously an awesome weekend in Seattle. Excited for the fans, too. But um, but yeah, but also because of what happened in in Boston, uh, they didn't make too much progress. You don't want to change the scenery if you just change the scenery, Victor Robles, right? Like maybe maybe just stay around in Seattle until that OPS dwindles down. The real question about Victor Robles is who gets more money, him or Juan Soto? We will revisit that once the offseason begins. But as you mentioned, the Mariners did not gain any ground in the American League West because the Houston Astros strolled into Fenway Park, took their shoes through the mud, and then just wiped them all over the carpet in Boston because this was not particularly close. This is really the first time in a while, it feels, that we've seen the Red Sox just look like the uninspiring lackluster pile of nothing that we thought they would be but this Astros lineup just showed up and honestly more important for them was the start that they got on Saturday from Spencer Arigetti tossing seven innings two runs 13 punch outs yeah and if you've seen I mean Boston since the all-star break has basically been the best offense and the worst pitching staff. I mean, the, reg- the regression has come for these pitchers about as harsh as, as you could imagine. Now at the same time, the lineups kind of bailed them out and, and kept them in it. I mean, you mentioned this is the Red Sox looking really just not like the team that we started to be convinced is actually pretty solid. This was also the most commanding like oh yeah right that's houston you know i mean with what yordan was doing with what bregman who we've we've still kind of been waiting for him and i believe we're still waiting on kyle tucker right i mean this is a guy that's now been injured for for a month plus and he was he was their best player for the first two months so that's another piece that they are in in theory going to get back decently soon that would be a a, a massive deal um for for houston so So, i mean yordan just just a word on bregman word on bregman like you you say waiting for him. Really, he has been Alex Bregman since early May. On May 9th, he had a 534 OPS. And since then, he is an 846 OPS. He got off to just a horrible start. 
over the first month and change. And since then, he's been, you know, not one of the 20 best players in the world or anything, but like he has been which which he was. He was that. So I, I, that's why I would, I would say you're you're being a little kind because of kind of the, the heights he had reached. But he's been good. That's true. He, he has been he has not been a problem the way that he was the first month. That's that's totally fair. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just especially in fact, I feel like we've just watched so many Red Sox Astros games. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, multiple hits and all these all these. Uh, I mean, Bregman, I guess, has, you know, seven hits, doesn't strike out once, three walks, you know, four RBIs like this is. That's when Bregman's really cooking. He's not striking out at all, and he's actually, you know, pulling the ball with authority. And and that's obviously what happened this weekend. Also, Jordan Alvarez God mode when he's locked in. It's it's you know it, it reminds me of uh, Angels in the Outfield Kit Hitter Die Kessie, where it's just like the the prototype of a middle of the order slugger who you're just horrified of whenever they're coming up to hit. Uh, he has a eleven thirty five OPS since the start of July. Uh, but but it's it's interesting though because he had he had gone cold on a homer homer wise he had before I think last week he had one home run in his previous twenty four games even though he was still hitting well and then now he's got five in his last five games so yeah I mean he's he is still when he's on a top one to three <laughs> hitter or at least what you're describing who you are least excited about to have you know strolling to the plate in a big spot he is he is singular in that sense and uh yeah that's 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 why and he's been there right this is why we say to houston it's like hey as long as those guys are still on the team there's going to be times when they look like one of the best teams of baseball and if you're getting 13 strikeouts from spencer Aragetti, you're probably going to have a decent weekend they've been to seven alcs's in a row for a reason like when they were 12 and 14 on may 9th or whatever it wasn't like jose altuve and alex bregman were pooping their pants there were a lot of obituaries written about this team prematurely and i can imagine they especially alex bregman has those receipts in a folder or a album on his phone somewhere that we will see when october reaches now uh, these teams are tied mariners astros atop the division how this goes down the stretch will be very interesting because Whoever doesn't win this division is almost certainly not getting into the playoffs just because I think As what is that? Now. they're yeah. three back, two and a half back of the wild card. It just it feels like they're going to have to win the division uh, before we move on. Quick word on Jaron Duran. Jaron Duran dropped the old uh, F word homophobic slur to a fan during the game on Sunday. It was caught on a hot mic. He issued a apology that he almost certainly did not write. Uh, the Red Sox uh, then followed suit with one, echoing the statement that Jared Duran made, even though it's hard to echo yourself. We talked about uh, a lot of homophobia in baseball last week when we were discussing Billy Bean's passing. And this is what we said. Like, this exists. The comfort level with which Duran said this is really disheartening. And it matters because, like... It's clear that he is when you say something like that, you have not spent around time, spent time around queer people enough to understand why that is hurtful and why your words have power. And like, does it it like, yeah, it just. Yeah, it's it's the it's the carelessness. It's and that's that's what's so disheartening and disappointing is is right. It's it's not even about measuring the sincerity of the apology or how much hate is in Jaron Duran's heart. It's just that like it's per- when we use the word pervasive, it's this is what you're working against. It's working against years of just comfort of throwing around words that obviously are not acceptable in any context. And yet because of the history of the sport and the general arena or I guess environment f- that has existed for so long, it enables, you know, or, or allows for this to happen in Literally standing in a home plate at Fenway Park with a packed house in a season where all year you've had cameras going around you like that's what it is. It's it's the thing that it says it's it's a combination of the comfort and the I mean, it's again, it's, that's what is so both shocking and why it is a reminder and what speaks to that. You know, it's it's not necessarily about Jared Durant specifically being a hateful homophobe, which I, I can't I'm not going to speak to that specifically. It's that. It is the complete lack of understanding that that is or clear level of comfort to be like, yeah, that's a word I can say, not just (laughs) not just when I'm in the clubhouse with my with my teammates, but also in front of everybody on television in a season in which cameras have been around you all year. Yeah, 
kind of unacceptable. Very unacceptable. I think MLB will suspend him. They suspended Kevin Pillar for a handful of games when something similar to this happened, I believe, in 2017. And that's going to be that's going to be the end of Jaron Duran's games played. He was trying to play 162 this year, and that's what you get. You, I mean, that's that is the. Uh, uh, I mean, that's obviously not relevant to the punishment, but it's like it is a reminder of how incredibly careless and and stupid and and obviously how not OK the words in general. But it's just so disappointing. And, uh, you know, we spent plenty of time talking about it last week. And it's just a reminder of how how far we still kind of have to go with this, because if this is still happening this frequently, then we we have much progress to be made. One more sweep over the weekend. The Dodgers taking the Pirates to town. The Buccos are now on an L7 completely. This is the bottom falling out of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Paul Skeens was fine. Probably his worst start since his debut. Dodgers knocked him around a little bit. And then on Sunday, Teoscar Hernandez walk off. And it's important that the Dodgers keep winning because the Padres and Diamondbacks certainly aren't going to stop. And so they need to keep pace if they want to keep those guys in the rear view mirror. Yeah. And again, like, Skeens still went six innings <laughs> and struck out eight and walked one. But, you know, four runs allowed is too many when you have the Pirates offense, quote unquote, supporting you. So that's kind of where the Pirates are at. It's unfortunate. I, you know, we we really had hoped that they would make more significant additions to bolster this team. And the ones that they made have not worked out so far. That is not especially shocking when you consider who those players were. But to, again, this was important for the Dodgers to make sure they they take care of business here because they are getting pushed. And Arizona and San Diego, who we'll get to here in a little while, are three and a half back. So this is not going to be – they are not going to be – partially because obviously the Dodgers are still a flawed team, but also because they're they are – being pushed the teams chasing them are, are are better i think the other dodgers thing we should mention is the mookie Betts news uh that he will be returning and not playing shortstop anymore now when i saw this i was like okay i guess that sort of makes sense that we eventually arrived to this conclusion but also it's just to make room for nick ahmed <laughs> <laughs> and Miguel Rojas, it seems like they are just going to stick with the defense. It, it's in some ways, it seems to be a pretty strong acceptance that Mookie bets the defender, which again, God bless him. Unbelievable that he was able to play major league shortstop every day on the fly. Basically that that did not, that did not feel like that was their best team. And so the fact that they're willing to just kind of put him back out in the outfield and, and, you know, allow the shortstop position to still probably be a position of weakness deep offensively is an interesting decision, but maybe not a shocking one. Dodgers with a tricky stretch coming up four against the Brewers in Milwaukee this week. An opportunity for both sides, then at Cardinals, Mariners, Rays, Orioles, Diamondbacks. That is a hefty stretch. Yes, yes, yes. And, and the Brewers, yeah, Brewers have, have, have played well. We'll get to them a little bit later. Uh, two more series before we take a break, Jake. We did have two opportunities, as you mentioned. Those are the four game sets. The first one involved a NL West team, and that was the Arizona Diamondbacks, who welcomed the Phillies of Philadelphia to Chase Field for a nice little NLCS reunion. And the Snakes continue to play very well, taking three out of four. Corbin Carroll is. I, I, we were definitely a little bit premature in the middle of the year when he would have like two good games. And it was like, he's back. Like, no, he was clearly still working on a lot of stuff. Nine homers in his last 28 games compared to two in his first 87. That's from PHNX Diamondbacks on Twitter. Uh, he, and he just, again, he's looking more like Corbin Carroll. He had a walk-off home run along the way. He's reaching base. He is uh, stealing bags. And when you combine, like, this is just, again, remember, they lose Christian Walker right before the trade deadline. That was in incredible timing because they were able to plug in Josh Bell. But this offense is just is just great. I mean, it's it, to me, it's it's not really that complicated. You know, you have an MVP candidate in Cattell Marte and you have Corbin Carroll starting to play like himself again. You can become a pretty good offense pretty quickly. The homer Corbin Carroll hit off of Jose Alvarado was a great sign that he's back. If you can take, like, 99 backside left on left out over the fence 
you're not scuffling anymore. That's not something struggling hitters do. But it's and so, so to see, yeah, it it's just so funny because that's like the exact thing I wrote about when I saw early in the season when Carroll was terrible in, in in the first month. He hit a homer left left to left field off in Cincinnati, and that's when I did the whole thing on him and talking about his swing mechanics. And he was like, "Yeah, this is this is right. That's the swing where it all comes together." Off Alvarado is even more impressive. So. You hope that that can can continue for them because obviously the snakes being fun and good is is I think at this point a, a great thing for baseball. <laughs> um, the Phillies have the worst record in baseball since the All Star break, non White Sox division. <laughs> okay, worst record, yes, uh, among the twenty nine regular major major league, league, league baseball, baseball teams. teams. They have the worst team by a major league baseball team <laughs> since the All Star break. Uh, uh, it's cause for concern. Yes. Yeah. I don't think they're bad. They are, I think like pretty average since the middle of June. Uh, th- thankfully for them, the Braves and Mets are equally disastrous. And so their lead atop the division is still at seven and a half. So there's really no need for panic. Uh, they were on a really, again, they were on a 10 day road trip. They went four and six against, the Mariners, Diamondbacks, and Dodgers, which is a pretty imposing group. They won that series against LA. They go home now to play, I think, the Nats and the, and the Marlins. So if they drop some of those games, then we can really get concerned. Last four game uh, matchup was Twins against the Guardians. The Twins took both games in the doubleheader on Friday to trim the lead in the divisional one and a half which is the closest it's been really all season long. Gardo's bounce back, take him on Saturday and on Sunday. The lead is now three and a half. Emmanuel Classe with saves in both of those games, Saturday and Sunday. He's now up to 35 saves, leading the league. His ERA is, I think, 0.68, which is just a joke. He's unbelievable. Uh, but I think this thing is going to get closer than we realize. Yeah, no, it, it definitely is. I think that the most encouraging thing for Cleveland was Tanner Bybee looked very good. He's been injured. Again, so many questions about what we saw Alex Cobb make his debut. That wasn't particularly awesome. He was good and they left him in too long. But Bybee's, that's a pitcher that, you know, when he's cooking, like that's a pitcher we feel good about, you know, starting a postseason game. And as it stands right now, that's he's kind of the only one you, you feel that way about with, on this Cleveland staff. And so he's going to really need to deliver in the regular season if they are going to get uh, to the postseason, or at least if they are going to, you know, win this division comfortably. So those two teams, I'm curious if they actually play again, because that that has been obviously a great, uh, a great kind of series all season long. They yeah, so they have one more series, I believe, in September. Yeah, one of the one of the last series in Cleveland, also four games in the middle of September. So that is sure to be I expect to be there for for most of those games. So that should be a, a fun time. But those were the opportunities. Uh, we are going to take a quick break and we return. We will run through the rest of the action from the weekend. Welcome back to Baseball Barbecast. Jake Mintz, Jordan Schusterman. It's time for a little warm, fuzzy feeling. The obvious one, Mallory Swanson scoring the gold medal winning goal for Team USA in Paris. You get the great clip of Dansby out of his locker talking about it, beaming, wearing the jersey, the the U.S. Women's National Team jersey. Um, The Dansby-Mallory-Swanson relationship is just a wonderful delight, and I think they do legitimately push one another. There were quite a few jokes about, like, oh, Dansby plays the White Sox today, and Mallory is winning a gold medal in the Olympics against Brazil. Certainly different levels um, but was cool to see that. The one warm, fuzzy feeling I want to focus on, Jordan, was the 2014 World Series reunion at Oracle Park on Saturday. Giants took two out of three. They're only one and a half back in the wild card, which just doesn't make sense in my head. They've been playing much better. But Madison Bumgarner in attendance, really the first public sighting of him we've had since the Diamondbacks asked him to please quietly leave the premises at the beginning of last season. Doesn't seem like he's going to play again. There was chatter about him retiring as a giant at some point in the future. Why has he not been pitching? Well, Jordan, in today's edition of former Giants stalwarts open businesses in the wilderness, uh, it appears that Mr. Madison Bumgarner is working uh, for a ranch and cattle company, 4440 
is nestled in the foothills of North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountains. It's a family-owned, operated farm, courtesy of Madison and Allie Bumgarner and Mark, Jennifer, and Tanner Saunders. They've always had livestock on the farm, from standard beef cattle to longhorns from roping. But Jordan, you know, it wasn't until five years ago on a hunting trip that they discovered the flavor experience that is Wagyu beef. That's right, friends. Madison Bumgarner is just selling Wagyu. You can go to the website. I think they might ship. Jordan, we should order some of Madison <laughs> Bumgarner's meat and do a taste test. The filet mignon is $50 a pound. Um, so many thoughts, but we have more to get to. However, you read some names there when you were describing the ranch. Uh, it was Madison Bumgarner and his wife, I think, Allie Bumgarner. And then who are the other names you, you mentioned there? Mark, Jennifer, and Tanner Saunders. Oh, interesting. So do we think <laughs> that this is where he got the inspiration for his secret rodeo identity, Mason Saunders? <laughs> Seems like that <laughs> might sure be possible. Seems. If you don't know what we're talking about, and if you don't know why Jake said we were referencing another edition of former Giants open businesses, go listen to our podcast recently where we talked about Brandon Belt being the host of a fisher a fishing tournament, and go Google Bay Madison Bumgarner Mason Saunders Rodeo. Okay, just wanted to. You can also away. buy some of Ali Bumgarner's custom hats that she sells that. on the website. As someone and who wears a hat every episode of this podcast, I am much more compelled by. Don't think these are your kind of hats, but <laughs> okay. I appreciate the sure. optimism. Wait, let me, I just want to say one more thing about Bob Gardner, uh, and then we'll move on, is once you throw out a first pitch, non-Reese Hoskins division, right? I know that was a little bit special Aaron in Philly. Aaron Barrett. Aaron Barrett. That's another interesting one. I'm sure there's other... Whatever. You, you know what I'm getting at. And particularly Madison Bumgarner, like... You could kind of tell when you went out there to throw this first pitch to Buster Posey. <laughs> it's just like, this is not for him. He did pitch last year. Didn't go very well, but that was last season. Anyway, yeah, I think the Giants have a shot here. We we wrote, uh, we did our collab with MLB.com talking about playoff team, teams with like under 20% playoff odds that we think could make it. I, 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 I wouldn't pick them, but like, I think the Giants are good enough to like be in the mix here at the very end. Also, if you need to buy some meat, make sure you call 829-929-BEEF. Oh, that is easy, the phone number. Easy, easy to remember. All right, let's stay in the National League West for our Sorry for Your Mentions segment. Yes, every weekend we take a look at the mentions of a particularly unfortunate final score. And in this case, we got that courtesy of the Rockies because... The Braves and Rockies played three games over the weekend, and they split the first two. Jorge Soler. There's, one second. Some important context here. Braves roll into town on an L5. So they show up in Colorado on an L5, lose on Friday for an L6, and it's, and it's like, just panic Oh, stadiums. no. Oh, no. They yes. win on Saturday. Jorge Soler on absolute fire. He hit four home runs over the weekend. They take a big lead on Sunday. They're up 7-2 to two in the eighth, and then their pants fall down in front of the whole school. Everyone sees their underwear at the assembly because the Rockies string together seven runs in the eighth inning, Jake cave two run bomb, and then just a barrage of singles and doubles. And the Rockies win nine to eight. Oh, and so that is, you know, that we said again, well, okay, where stuff happens, of course, but for the timing here for Atlanta, for it to have this crumbling disaster, and unfortunately, because I like the guy a lot, you know, we talk about, okay, Jorge Soler finally starting to, to heat up. It was not the best first week for him with the Braves. He's on fire. Oh, but who else did they acquire in that trade? Luke Jackson. Luke Jackson has a day uh, that he would like to forget, obviously allowing four runs here. Joe Jimenez also not great. Not Joe Jimenez has been very good this year, but uh, that it was not great in Colorado. On, on Sunday, and yeah, this is just a, a devastating seven runs in any inning in any context is not okay, uh, certainly when you are leading by six runs. May I begin? Sorry for your mentions, the original tweet from the Atlanta Braves. Rockies 9, Braves 8. Hashtag Braves. That is the final. <laughs> hashtag, <laughs> hashtag Braves. Hashtag, hashtag All right, Braves let's go. Eight. Let's read some replies. From at Bourbon Gamer, 
What the hell? It was eight to two when I went to poop. That's actually pretty relatable, although kind of a long poop, right? No judgment. No judgment. <laughs> uh, Nick says, fire everyone. Seriously. Seriously. He's not joking. He's Don't not do it. Joking. Right. Don't if fire he just them said, comedically. Well, but also, like, if he said fire everyone and just left it at that, I think most people would read that and be like, oh, he's joking. But he's not. Seriously. <laughs> everyone. Seriously. I fire everyone also kills me every time because it's like, who's really Who do you included want left? in that? Who's, who who's, who's really included in that? You can't fire everyone. No, because then you, then you won't have a team to watch. Exactly. Uh, Soap says, told y'all Snicker was an issue last year and the year before last. So wait, you told us the Brad Snicker was an issue in 2022 and they were winning 100,000 games and coming off a World Series? You might have a bad feel here, as, Soap. Yeah. As soon as, like, the second the parade was finished in 21, Soap was like, I don't like this guy. <laughs> Look, Jordan, any <laughs> any manager that's going to let Tyler Matzik almost get arrested, I just can't. Oh, that's true. That's true. That Was, was that a leader of men? That was questionable leadership. This one I love. This is from... Um, dogs grading services <laughs> this one says do not bring michael harris back to this horse there's no reason to push at this point this is the kind of attitude that i can never quite wrap my mind around and this is pervasive in the mariners when they were struggling leading up to the deadline where it's just like ah eh, screw it just just quit <laughs> like why like you don't I don't understand. Like, why are you a fan? Like, do you? Why? It's just, it's strange, but it's funny. Yeah, it's like Michael Harris doesn't deserve this. Speaking of Michael Harris, Michael Harris, the second enthusiast, tweets, at this point, we may be going, sorry, at this point, we may as well be going for first overall pick next year. All right. So just so, Tank. just so they Tank. know, Michael Harris, to, for, to my, for Michael Harris enthusiast information, as they sit right now, they are not in the lot like they got work to do if they want to even get in the lottery. They don't even have their record is too good to even be a part of it, you know, even though they are not, you know, in that in that postseason spot. So. um, So, yeah, I mean, I, I just I don't really know what to what to tell you, man, like that, that would take a lot of work. If you're if you're mad now, like you really want to watch them like really you lose over that. the next two yeah. months. Again, they, Jordan, they actually are still in a playoff oh, spot. Oh, they are still, they are still barely. So, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So they got, more. they got work to do there if they want to. Carlos says a lot of games left. The players will figure it out. We're not happy with the wild card. We'll, we're still after the NLE's title. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Carlos. Oh, my gosh. That's what congratulations that's what on your uplifting mentions. Yeah, seriously. I love that. Yeah, mix it Crispy says, it's simply who this team is this year. As soon as we accept that, the easier it'll be. There's always a couple teams every year. The baseball gods decide to humble. It was our turn. Now, this is a much more reasoned take. This is, I think this is the best one. This is the one where I'm like, you know what? You might know ball. <laughs> the rest of these people i'm less i'm less compelled by um but speaking anyway, of not knowing yeah. ball the last tweet this is one of my least favorite critiques that fans make freaking hard to watch this team not the same energy since they collapsed last year going into the playoffs sometimes they didn't go they didn't collapse going into the playoffs did they they just <laughs> no. collapsed in the playoffs. pretty sure sometimes during Sometimes I wonder if winning matters to them. I'm sure it does. But watching the laughing and choking in the dugout as they lose games is tough to take. Someone replies, if they gave a crap, they wouldn't be laughing or joking. They make their millions whether they win or lose. Look, people. We've they talked about this every before. Day. They've talked about this before. It's like, do you want them to just all be sitting on the bench like, Shoulder to shoulder, just like staring ahead. <laughs> Do you Somberly. want Travis Darno to like be crying on the top step? Like when you go into the locker room after the game, even any good team in a regular season loss, I find the atmosphere in there is artificially somber. 
Totally. In a way because that it doesn't need to be. Because they think that this is what they're supposed to Right. No, totally. But in the dugout, they're not. It's just, what do you want? Right. Especially when, again, two months to go. Uh, that is sorry for your mentions. Uh, we, <laughs> one of our favorites. We're going to take a quick break and when we return, we will uh, wrap up with the remaining series from the weekend that was. Welcome back to the end of Baseball Barbacast. Jake Mintz, Jordan Schusterman. We're going to hear about Jordan's trip to Toronto in a second, but first, we're going to combine two segments together. Player of the weekend and first time for everything. I'm going to start with first time for everything. This is a play I'd never seen before. And whenever I see a quote on MLB.com that's like, that's the first time I've ever seen this, or I've never seen that, or we got to throw it into this category. Luis Arise said this quote, I've never seen that, said Luis Arise, who was on deck for the final out of the game. What was the final out of the game? One run game, top nine, Hassan Kim drives one deep to left. Ball hits the top of the wall, bongs off left fielder Kyle Stowers, and then goes over the fence. That is a ground rule double and not a home run, even though the ball never touched the ground because it hit the fence first. Mike Schilt was uh, talking about how the rule maybe wasn't fair. I think, should this, let's get let's get to it first. It's not a home run. Should this be? Um, I don't think so. Because if the ball yeah. hits the wall and then goes over the fence, it's a home run. Yeah. Like I if mean, it hits the wall with backspin and it goes. True. I think that like, the thing is, is obviously we've seen, you know, right, if it hits, if you just clang it over, if you alley-oop the fly ball and right. dunk it over the fence. But that That's is why this the, is confusing. That's why this is confusing. Because if it hits the fence and then goes over, it's a homer. If it hits the outfielder and then goes over, it's a homer. But if los dos, not a homer. <laughs> but I think in spirit, when you're going for the ball, if it bounces up the fence first, it's even less out of it's even less in your control once it hits something else. And so I think at that point, it is weird again when you to your point, right? Like if it bounces at all, but if you didn't do it, then you you were still the one that hit the home run. Now again, the <laughs> the fielder clanging it over, I know it's confusing. He did say the rule was called correctly. I know that they didn't love it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it does to feel, me, as Schultz says, it feels like home run. I, I get that. The essence of the rule is the floor is lava. <laughs> right. And right. no ball in lava. So anyway, the reason this mattered is because it was a one run game. Kim doesn't end up scoring. Marlins take the finale. But San Diego takes two or three down to Miami. One of the first two games in the series in extras. They, they weren't their sharpest, but they did win the series. And Jake freaking burger made it very difficult for them yes so jake burger has 12 homers in his, in his 23 games since uh, the all-star break that is the most in lb and he was obviously when the marlins are horrible at the beginning of the season and still not very good like he was not it, it, we were starting to feel like ah you know jake burger like limited player uh, you know he'll have some moments but it's not like okay it, it felt like uh maybe we saw the best of him last year no no i mean when he's when he's cooking he's he's just so fun because he just swings so much and swings so hard and is able to hit pitches out of the zone i mean the, the pitch he hit off dylan cease was not a good pitch and he just got to it and, and drove it out because he has ridiculous juice but my player of the weekend is not jake Berger. it's jackson merrill because the reason why that almost you know, victory on Sunday was so felt so compelling was because they came, they had these ridiculous wins on Friday and Saturday because Jackson Merrill cannot stop homering in the ninth inning of a close game. And, you know, I know we talked about him in a rookie of the year context. You made the point that statistically what he and Mesa win have done isn't that different. I think that that was a fair point, but I and maybe it's anecdotal, but also there are real numbers to back this up that Sarah Langs is, is churning out with regularity. Just the number of go-ahead game tying home runs that Jackson Merrill has had is absurd. I mean, he did it in back-to-back -back days. He's done it now five or six times this season. He has, I just there are fewer players that I can imagine can remember having more big moments of any player, let alone as 21-year-old rookies. So he's tremendous. And you know, I tweeted out the poll. We've all been talking about this, but I just wanted to send it to the masses. You know, pick your Jackson, pick your Gen Z Jackson for the next 10 years, Merrill, Holiday, or Churio. And I was doing that like after the Merrill. Normally, sometimes it's like, oh, well, this is bad because there's recency bias. Okay, now everyone's going to vote for Merrill. And this poll got 
nearly 13,000 votes, which is a lot for a Twitter poll. <laughs> like, I do a lot of these. And Holiday still won, you know, 48%, Merrill 31%, Churio 21%. And in the replies, there's people just viciously defending all three of these saying, you're an idiot if you don't think this is the answer. And that is the that is the making of a good poll. And that's why I put it out there, because I don't know. This is hard. I'm just glad I get to watch both these all three of these guys for the next 10, 20 years. Jackson Job, where are you at? Yeah, Jackson Job, no pressure, buddy, because uh, this is clearly the name that you want to have <laughs> if you want to break in and, and star in Major League Baseball. But all three of these guys are are outstanding and it'll be it'll be fun to watch them. Orioles trading away Jackson Bowmeister at the deadline could come back to haunt them. Jordan, let's put this thing into turbo mode. Let's do five. We got five series to cover and then talk about the one you were at. Orioles taking two out of three against the Rays in Tampa. If the Orioles had won the last game, which they did lose on Sunday, they would have gone seven and oh in the trap, which is wild because the Orioles have just been so bad in the trap for so long. They had like a ridiculous losing streak there when they were bad and the Rays were good every year. Jackson Holiday homers again on Saturday. Anthony Santander deserves kind of a longer conversation at some point. That guy is going to get paid, paid. I believe he's up to 35 home runs in the year. Orioles get another unbelievable spots like replacement start from Albert Suarez on Sunday, but the bullpen can't hold it. You know who got the loss for the Orioles on Sunday? I don't. Take a guess. <laughs> Was it Craig Kimbrell? It was Craig Kimbrell who <laughs> I didn't, uh, I didn't watch two, any of that series. So I have no idea. <laughs> walked two hitters in the eighth inning in a tie game. Wasn't really holding anybody on. They stole four bags on him in one inning, and the Rays win that two to one. Orioles still tied atop the division with the Yankees, who took two out of three against the Rangers. Friday's game rained out. They split the doubleheader on Saturday before the Yankees outlast Texas on Sunday, eight to seven. Yankees were up big, almost blew this one, but they hold on. Jazz Chisholm is up to seven ding-dongs as a member of the New York Yankees. Judge and Soto go back-to-back on Sunday. He has 42 home runs. Maybe one day we'll all hit 42 home runs. Uh, and this is going to go down to the wire here with the O's. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, I'll just I'll just say this here. Like, it's cool looking at the standings. We got Astros and Mariners tied. We got Orioles and Yankees tied. We got Twins three and a half back. Max and Padres three and a half back, and then Cardinals and Braves seven and a half back. But there is some nice symmetry across the standings there, and and yeah, this is this is kind of what we want is is a multiple very compelling division races because the stakes of winning your division are so high now, and uh, this is going to be pretty pretty fun to watch uh, down down the stretch. Angels Nationals playing a very bizarre two game set in the Anthony Rendon Bowl, and guess who showed up for that? Anthony Rendon going five for ten. Really? Oh, I didn't realize games. they did. They did. They, uh, it was it was three games. It was three games. Oh, the sorry, they played a three game set. I apologize. Rendon only played in two of them, and he went five for ten in those two games. The Nats take two out of three. Won the first two games of the series. The Angels take the finale. Jose Tena, who the Nats traded for uh, during the deadline, he is up. Something to keep an eye on for the Nats. Jordan, I need to go, so you're not allowed no, to talk about He Jose could be Tana. the third baseman next year, like opening day. I think Jose Tan is really good. Uh, the Cardinals and Royals played two games. Uh, the Cardinals won one, the Royals won the other. That is all we have to say about that. <laughs> Finally. Um, oh, the Reds. Uh, they uh, Reds. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ellie had probably his worst weekend of the year. 0 for 13, nine strikeouts. Reese hits a huge home run. Uh, the Brewers take two of three, and they listen to me saying, oh, you're going to blow the division lead. Uh, they're probably not going to do that. Yeah, Finally, they're definitely not going to do that. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely not going to do that. I like watching the Brewers. I, I'm, they're, they're fun. I don't know how they're getting outs, but good for them. And finally, Jake, and then you are excused to do more important things than I have to do today. I am in Toronto. I did watch the A's and the Blue Jays yesterday. Chris Bassett gave up six runs in the first inning. And then afterwards was like, the roof was closed. I wasn't ready for that. To be fair, I also wasn't ready for that because when I walked in two hours before the game, it was beautiful. And then apparently it was pouring uh, during pregame and they never opened the roof. And then Chris Bassett got blasted by the A's. But you know what the real problem was for Chris Bassett? He was facing the A's. And what have we been saying about the A's, Jake? They bang. they bang. Lawrence Butler, Blade, Geloff was getting in on the action. Rook, it was, it was like, it was so fun. I was like, you know what? This A's team is great. I am having a great time. Vlad, his 22 game hitting streak is snapped. That was unfortunate. And the highlight of my experience <laughs> yesterday was 
<laughs> I'm sitting, sitting with my wife in the seats and we're walking out to get food. And this like probably 10 year old kid is just kind of walking out towards the concourse with his dad exasperated. And he just goes, dad, the athletics are the best team in the MLB. <laughs> and I was like, you're right. Kid knows ball. It's <laughs> He's right. I mean, it's hard to fault. You him. only watched that first inning. You would know nothing else. Oakland takes the series in Toronto, Toronto. Hey, keep on losing. That's really the best thing that can happen Good. to you right now. Uh, Chris Bassett takes the responsibility. I takes the responsibility. It was weird. You've the, been in Toronto. There's no way he hasn't pitched with the roof closed. I was just like confused by that. I made no sense. Like, I understand it. It changes some things, but. When baseball players do the thing where they're like, no excuses, but here are the excuses. <laughs> right. It was like, come on, come on, come on. We, we can do that. I did. Here, ready? I, I can do this. I did not play well today. And I hope to play well in the future. Wow. That was I impressive. understand with the media asking the same questions all the time, it gets repetitive. Totally. But totally. yeah, a- after I have a bad pot, I'll call Jordan and say, you know, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't talk well today. Here's last thing. We'll say goodbye. Chris Bassett, here's what you say. Ah, uh, listen. The roof was closed. Wasn't prepared for that. Also, the A's are the best team in the MLB. So, what do you want me to do? The whole MLB. Uh, thank you all for listening to this Monday edition of Baseball Barbecast. Thank you to Hillary Georgie for producing. You can email us at baseballbarbecast at gmail dot com. I will be recording on Wednesday from Detroit, Michigan. I'll be seeing the Mar- Mariners tomorrow night and Avril tonight. Thank you all for listening, and we'll talk to you all very soon. <laughs>